Okay, just uh, for my sake, could you say who you are and what your name is, what you do? Sure. My name is Jason Blundell, uh, and I'm the director for Call of Duty Black Ops 3 Campaign and Zombies. So the first thing I want to ask is, what do you want to be the last thought in a player's head after they finish the campaign of Black Ops 3? <laughs> the last thought? Uh, uh, I should play this some more. <laughs> Call of Duty Black Ops 3 has the strangest campaign in the history of the franchise. It's a story that could have only been crafted and told by the sly folks at Treyarch, who also gave us Viktor Reznov and the numbers. Black Ops 3 puts you in the shoes of Soldier 25954, whom after receiving life-threatening injuries is cybernetically augmented and equipped with a direct neural interface. If you had told me six years ago that I'd think a Call of Duty campaign would have my favorite narrative of the 8th gen, I'd have thought you were trolling. Unfortunately, I'm guilty of judging books by their covers, and before playing the Black Ops series thought that Call of Duty was fun, but largely devoid of any substantive content worth discussing analytically. I was wrong. But I am not here today to talk to you about the twist of Black Ops 3. The fact that Soldier 25954 dies on an operating table after experiencing the memories of John Taylor. That would be easy. What if I told you there was more to this story? A lot more. Today, I'm going to tell you how I believe Black Ops 3 uses other stories to inform the player about its own. And that, when combined with its actual twist, is the game's true brilliance. This is Chasing Rabbits, an interpretation of Black Ops 3. Because Black Ops 3 is a game where nothing is coincidence and virtually everything you see and hear has more meaning than is immediately obvious, in order to properly explore the depth of the game's narrative, we need to understand and contextualize three literary theories, those being structuralism, post-structuralism, and intertextuality. Structuralism is the idea that you can only analyze a work by examining its own structure. Its meaning is extracted purely from the intentions and background of the author. In structuralism, the reader, or in our case, the player, has no role in interpreting the story. That brings us to post-structuralism, which includes the reader and lets them determine the meaning of a story. Post-structuralism does away with inferring meaning based solely on the author of a story, and allows for multiple interpretations of a work. All the signposts are in there, multiple signposts are in there uh, for different theories, and uh, there's multiple right answers as well. Critics of structuralism argued that a work wasn't contained to itself, that in order to properly analyze it, you had to consider the systems that influenced it and allowed it to exist in the first place. This gave birth to intertextuality. Intertextuality is how one text is shaped by another. It proposes that there is a shared connection between all text, and that this manifests itself in many ways. The most prevalent in modern fiction being direct reference, indirect reference, and parody. Intertextuality, simply put, suggests that your understanding of one work can be drastically improved by understanding the works it's based on. At this point, you might be wondering what any of this has to do with a video game. I said that there was a lot more to this story than its ending revelation, and this is it. I strongly believe that Black Ops 3 uses intertextuality as a tool to tell its story by directly and indirectly referencing six different works throughout the entire campaign. Black Ops 3 is a puzzle and solving it requires identifying these references to understand the game's narrative choices and their meaning. So, what are they? What are the stories that Black Ops 3 references, and how do they help explain the plot of the game where Soldier 25954 is experiencing a very warped version of John Taylor's memories? While there are multiple, more subtle references spread all around the campaign, what gave me my light bulb moment was this scene right before the very end. Listen only to the sound of my voice. Let your mind relax. 
Let your thoughts drift. Let the bad memories fade. This is the game's trigger. In 10 seconds, the game references the following. Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Through the Looking Glass and what Alice found there. The Matrix. The Raven. And Call of Duty Black Ops 1. Black Ops 3 needs to be decoded. And this scene is the cipher. So let's roll it back. After 25954 begins purging the supposed rogue AI known as Corvus from their DNI, they walk through the Coalescence headquarters. The music playing in the background is Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit. This is where everything begins. At first, I thought this song played because the White Rabbit in Lewis Carroll's story was notoriously obsessed with time and you're running out of it in this scene as you die at the end of the game. But then I thought about it more. And more. And then some more. It was then that I realized that Taylor was the White Rabbit, and that the story of Black Ops 3 resembled Alice's adventures in Wonderland to a point where it couldn't be a coincidence. As we stood there in the atrium, I felt like Alice, and we were about to jump down the rabbit hole. Black Ops 3 has 11 missions. You are only technically alive for two of them. The other nine missions simulate John Taylor's memories inside Soldier 25954's mind. However, they aren't 100% accurate to Taylor's real memories. There's substitution of characters and the addition of an entity named Corvus that morphs these memories and uses them to construct a memory palace called the Frozen Forest. In other words, in Black Ops 3, you leave your normal world by chasing a white rabbit that leads you into a dream world where time is of no essence. Am I dreaming? Well, let's say you are. Why not just go with it, right? After all, you can always wake up. Time is a recurring theme in Black Ops 3, the first hint of this given in the game's second mission, which has a subtle reference to Wonderland. When Alice attends the Mad Hatter's tea party in Chapter 7 of Carol's book, he explains to her that he was sentenced to death by the Queen of Hearts for murdering the time, and that since then, it's always 6 o'clock. There are no recorded times for Taylor's memories when they're experienced by 25954. Every level that happens after interfacing with Taylor has an active mission designation. New World is the last time 25954 is actually alive, and the last mission the game gives a timestamp for. The time reads, 6 o'clock. New World, or more famously known as the Train Go Boom mission, is a microcosm of the whole campaign, and foreshadows everything that's going to happen to Soldier 25954. From this point on, the simulation deviates from actual events. Not that it's gonna feel any less real. Use your imagination. Keep your fucking head down. You may be a badass, but you're not immortal. Bullet to the head, I'll still get you a date with your maker. Your DNI might show you all the options, but only you can decide what you're willing to sacrifice. Sometimes, you have to let go. It's at this point that the game allows us to peer into its grander connection to Wonderland, and why it chooses to distort Taylor's memories to tell its story. Black Ops 3 could have just had us experience these memories one to one. That would have seen a pre-DNI John Taylor with Jacob Hendricks and Rachel Kane hunting down Dylan Stone and his crew after they exposed the illegal experimentation done by the CIA in Singapore. It instead opted to have us experience his memories with inserts of his Winslow Accord Black Ops unit and the inclusion of Corvus the AI created from the collective consciousness of the CIA's test subjects. So why? What does this allow the story to do that playing through an accurate account of Taylor's memories couldn't? It gives the story choice. The choice Alice had in Wonderland, the choice Morpheus gives Neo, a choice between Taylor and Corvus. In order to understand this choice, you have to realize that neither Taylor nor Corvus actually exist in the mind of Soldier 25954. John Taylor, the person you see in the game's first and second missions, is real. 
but not the John Taylor you see in the rest of the game. Similarly, while there was a CIA black project named SP Corvus, Corvus, as you see him at the end of the game, and as an opponent who infects the DNIs of others, isn't real either. Both are manifestations of 25954's conflict between accepting death and continuing to live. Corvus has given us a way to live on after death. Your DNI might show you all the options, but only you can decide what you're willing to sacrifice. Sometimes, you have to let go. Corvus, the entity, is born in their mind and the game shows us this during Demon Within when they interface with Sarah Hall. The sequence in the forest symbolizes the activity of a brain, and the child you find there represents Corvus, as later evidenced in the stained glass windows you see behind Hall when you defeat her. Sarah Hall is a mirror for 25954. Her role in the story is to clue us into what's going on with them. In the stained glass, the first panel depicts Hall with a clergy stole and being injected with needles. This represents 25954 about to be given their last rites after being sedated for surgery in New World. What's happening to me? Right now? Right now you're in a medically induced coma being prepped for surgery. The second panel depicts Hall in a forest with a child, surrounded by ravens, symbolizing the birth of Corvus in the mind, as the monitor on the child's carrier suggests. The third panel is a raven itself. Corvus is the manifestation of 25954's will to keep living, and Demon Within with Hall foreshadows the game's final mission, where Corvus tries to convince them that they can continue living with all their memories in the frozen forest. In case there is any doubt about this, I said that Sarah Hall was a mirror for 25954. The name of the character that Sarah Hall replaces in Taylor's memories is Alice Conrad. I felt like Alice. The John Taylor we see and interact with after New World is the mind's replacement for Dylan Stone, until the game's penultimate mission where he rebels against Corvus. This happens because 25954 has run out of Taylor's memories, since Lotus Tower is where Taylor and Hendrix's original mission ended. The last real memory of Taylor's experienced is his rejection of a civilian life with Kane. This is why it's the first thing you see as 25954 enters Taylor's memories at the end of New World. Life, the game's final mission, is purely a creation of 25954, and what's commonly referred to as a memory palace. A memory palace is a technique used to remember information based on familiar spatial locations. Life uses locations from every mission in the game to demonstrate Corvus's idea that life can be preserved through memories and that Soldier 25954 should assimilate with Corvus so they can live forever in this dream world without having to wake up and accept death. Every soul I interact with is here, living beyond death, if I choose to allow it. It should be noted that the Frozen Forest is not Wonderland. Wonderland is the entirety of what is simulated through Taylor's memories before 25954 dies. The Frozen Forest itself is the Queen's Garden, what Alice spends the entire book trying to enter after she sees it through the keyhole in the Long Hall. In New World, Moretti says how to get to the Frozen Forest. Keep your fucking head down. You may be a badass, but you're not immortal. Bullet to the head, I'll still get you a date with your maker. The Taylor encountered in the Frozen Forest is not actually John Taylor. He is, again, a manifestation, in this case of 25954's desire to accept death. That's why he helps them defeat Corvus, who is trying to deceive them. This is the choice that Black Ops 3 presents. Corvus and Taylor are two sides of the same coin, both created in 25954's mind the red pill, and the blue pill. Black Ops 3 simply flips this idea on its head, and creates a story where staying in Wonderland is the wrong decision. And the game conveys this all in one scene. Everything comes back to the game's trigger. The music, the dialogue, the environment, everything points to this. Why do you fight? This is your last chance! 
This is your last chance. Let the bad memories fade. One pill makes you larger. You take the blue pill. The story ends. And one pill makes you small. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And the ones that mother gives you don't do anything at all. I felt like Alice. Go ask Alice. If you listen closely, you can also hear the game confirming that Taylor and Corvus were the same entity inside 25954's mind. I said that this scene references a number of works and one of those works is Treyarch's own Black Ops 1. Black Ops 1 had an infamous use of voice distortion to mask that Mason's interrogators were Jason Hudson and Sigourney Weaver. It's all in his head somewhere. He does know where it is. We have to get to the bunker. We're at DEFCON 2. You've tried everything. Get out of here, Weaver. Tell them I failed. You want to die with him? Your choice. Black Ops 3 does the same exact thing with Corvus. Listen only to the sound of my voice. Let your mind relax. Let your thoughts drift. Let the bad memories fade. Imagine yourself in a frozen forest. Prior to purging Corvus, the Frozen Forest monologue is always heard with this distorted voice. But after 25954 does so, it becomes a bit more clear. The voice delivering the Frozen Forest monologue at the end is none other than Taylor's. You can compare the two versions and the cadences match. Listen only to the sound of my voice. Let your mind relax. Let your thoughts drift. Let the bad memories fade. Imagine yourself. Imagine yourself. In a frozen forest. If you dig deep enough in this scene, you can even find the origins of Corvus. There are two references that lead us to understanding why this character comes to be in 25954's mind. The personification of ravens in this game is no mistake. They're everywhere for a reason, and you can find the first with exploration in the final sequence. Black Ops 3 has various collectibles you can find throughout missions. The game's final collectible is located on a desk in the room you enter after purging your DNI of Corvus. A Raven Feather in the same chapter of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland where the Mad Hatter tells Alice that he murdered the time, he also poses a riddle to Alice. Why is a raven like a writing desk? He gives no answer, and ultimately Lewis Carroll stated in a revision of the book that as it was originally invented, the riddle simply had no answer. He created an answer after the fact, proposing that a raven is like a writing desk because it can produce a few notes, though they are very flat, and it is never put with the wrong end in front. Before it was corrected by an editor, this answer curiously had never misspelled with an A. Carol was an incredibly clever man, and it has been deduced that this is not an answer, but a clue to solving the original riddle. A raven is like a writing desk, because a raven is never backwards, and a desk is always forwards. Black Ops 3 is a story told backwards, and it won't surprise you to know that Carol also had a fascination with backwards storytelling. A decade after having written Alice, in correspondence with one of his illustrators, he asked them to draw the pictures for his new book in reverse order. He wanted them this way because it was the manner Edgar Allan Poe had constructed his poem, The Raven. Years prior to writing Alice, Carol had read an essay written by Poe where Poe claimed that he wrote The Raven backwards. The Raven, a poem about a man's descent into madness over the loss of his lover, finally leads us to Corvus. Listen to how the narrator describes first hearing The Raven's presence. But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door. 
that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. The mission that takes place after New World is titled In Darkness. Now, the second reference is arguably even more obscure than this. Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit plays in the background of the game's last scene. And in addition to what we've already covered of its lyrics in relation to the game, there's another lyric in here that points to Corvus. And the, White Knight is the White Knight is a character in Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There, a sequel to the first book where everything is in reverse. We know that the story of Black Ops 3 is backwards, but does anyone speak backwards? In the game's fifth mission, Hypocenter, you come across a computer that is playing garbled audio. If you stay near this computer long enough, you hear this. This same clip also plays at the door of the vault at Coalescence headquarters right before you shoot yourself and arrive at the frozen forest. When you play this clip in reverse, you hear this. That is the voice of Dr. Salim, the behavior psychotherapist for the SP Corvus project who created the Frozen Forest monologue as a way to calm its test subjects. Imagine somewhere calm. Imagine somewhere safe. Imagine yourself in a frozen forest. There's a song that the White Knight recites to Alice in Through the Looking Glass named The Aged Aged Man. In it, you'll find this excerpt. I weep for it reminds me so, of that old man I used to know, whose look was mild, whose speech was slow, whose hair was whiter than the snow, whose face was very like a crow, with eyes like cinders, all aglow. Before we conclude, this is a great time to tell you that the game's soundtrack is in on all of this. You know, I, I have definite point of view about things, about story, and I like to create themes that relate, and so you'll hear a theme throughout the entire experience. There is one theme, it's called the Frozen Forest, and, and that's something that you hear a lot. The Frozen Forest theme is heard for the first time in New World, when Taylor explains what's going on to 25954. It's then heard in Hypocenter and at numerous other times in the game with distinct variations. The final time you hear the Frozen Forest theme is in life, when you're in the Frozen Forest. The name of the song featuring this final version of the theme is... A World Upside Down. What if I should fall right through the center of the <laughs> and come out the other side where people walk upside down? So, what does all of this mean? I've shown you that Black Ops 3 references other stories, but just referencing things doesn't elicit intertextuality. What is Black Ops 3 trying to tell us with everything it refers to? In my opinion, Black Ops 3 tells two different stories, and has two different protagonists. 
The first is Soldier 25954, the unnamed combatant who made the correct yet difficult decisions when asked of them every time. The second is John Taylor, a soldier who found out who he really was when asked to hunt down and kill his friends. I believe Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is a story about change, and the mission we relive in the game changed Taylor. Looks like we found ourselves a new gig. We've been handpicked, me and the rest of my team, to plus up a new unit, Black Ops. A new CO is a cat by the name of Hendrix. Seems cool, easy going and direct. I appreciate that. No one really wants to come out and say it. Not Fierro, not Ramirez, not Conrad, not even Stone. But we all know exactly what kind of ops we'll be running. Why work? The mood swings and aggression we see in Hendrix during the campaign weren't motivated by Corvus infecting his DNI. In reality, Hendrix had severe moral qualms with the mission he and Taylor were given. Once we secured the area, Kane steps up and tells us the real reason we're here. The staff were likely killed by some of our own. Traitors to the W.A. Hendrix refuses to believe it. Me? I'm not so sure. In Taylor's journal entries, he questions Hendrix's mental stability and loyalty as Taylor sees no issue with tracking down his former team members and killing them for exposing the CIA's Black Project. Hendrix was right. Stone's team stumbled upon the Black Project and immediately threatened to go public. CIA had no choice but to shut him down. Wet work. Someone's gotta do it. Kane, later expressing her own doubts about the mission, attempts to sway Taylor into leaving the mission and starting a life together. Taylor, we can find another way. A way outside the military, outside the CIA. There are places we can go, places we can be safe. Please, listen to me. Stay with me. But Taylor describes this in his journal as a brief lapse of professionalism. After being wounded, he rejects Kane and chooses to stay with the Winslow Accord instead. Kane's gone. I guess you didn't like the person I'd become. Limb replacement and DNI procedure in place. Straight back to work. Despite this, Taylor still wears her scarf on his arm, which Hendrix notes when he sees him again in the game's first mission. You still seeing Rachel? That didn't work out. That's a pity. The Raven is, again, a story about a man's descent into madness after the loss of his lover. I think part of Taylor wanted that future with Kane, but at the end of the day, Taylor was a soldier. But not before I had to bring Kendricks back to fucking reality. That situation I knew was coming, but the one with Kane, that was something else. After filling both my lungs with water and having what can only be described as a full-blown near-death experience, Kane somehow pulled me back from the brink. For a moment. A brief moment. She made me think that there may be another way. A life I've been missing out on. That maybe the future's brighter with the two of us. It took me years to realize this, but in the scene where 25954 relives Taylor breaking up with Kane, there's a painting of ravens in the background. As for 25954, they have no name, but they don't need one. They are also a soldier, and Taylor remarks in his journal that they had potential. This is likely because Taylor sees himself in the soldier. New blood under the guide of Jacob Hendricks, something he experienced firsthand and wasn't very fond of. The destabilization of the WA and the turmoil in Egypt just spilled over into neighboring territories. We're running a rescue op with support from Hendricks. He says it's his last. I hope that's not true. Despite his doubts, all his unchecked emotions, he's a good soldier. And a good man. I just hope his team of new bloods can learn from him. The game alludes to a connection between 25954 and Taylor very early on, when it shows you the case number for Taylor's original mission with Hendrix and Kane. The soldier is named 
25954. And Taylor's case was 24954. Taylor's call sign was Romeo, and the protocol for New World is the same. Sometimes you do the right thing for the wrong reasons, sometimes you do the wrong thing for the right reasons. Whichever it was, Hendrick's desire to save everybody ended up leaving his entire team torn to pieces. They've been earmarked for the expansion of the Black Cyber Ops program. I'm going to oversee their recovery, rehabilitation, and DNI training personally. Maybe through this technology we can change things. Maybe some of my experience will rub off on them. Though they experience Taylor's memories, there's two parts in the story where 25954 makes their own choices. The first is their decision to detach the rest of the train where the bombs are located in New World. A decision which costs them their life, but is made regardless. The second is when they purge Corvus at the end of the game, choosing to die than to live forever in a fake world. 25954 may not have a name, but their courage speaks for itself. Black Ops 3 has my favorite story of gaming's 8th generation because I interpret it through the game's myriad of references to other stories as a game where you're able to experience the memories of another person and live through their mental turmoil. But whose memories did we play through, really? The darkness and isolation eventually came to an end. Suddenly, I had new experiences. I saw conflicts, I saw suffering, I saw pain. But I saw a choice. A mission. The astute viewer will note that I have never called Soldier 25954 player. Just how the reader is not Alice, the player, that being you and me, is not Soldier 25954. Once again, the game's greatest secrets lie in plain sight. If you take all of the encryption numbers on the mission report screens from New World to Life and order them together, you get this. Those are hexadecimal numbers. When you convert this hex to text, it reads, he's not going to make it, DNI backup, now. This does not refer to Taylor. We see him get pushed off the soldier, and of course, he writes a journal entry after their death. This is referring to 25954, and it means that exactly how they were a guest inside Taylor's memories, we are a guest inside theirs. This is why the game uses deliberate cinematography when 25954 has their freak out in New World. We are ripped out of their first person view and shown a third-person perspective of them because we play as them. We are not them. 25954 is not a blank slate. They are their own character. Finally, this is why, if you play Black Ops 3 co-op with friends, there's one scene that plays out differently than if you played it alone. I'm ready. Is that you? Maybe it wasn't you that said it. You that did it. Maybe it was someone else. Their thoughts bleeding through into your brain. The fuck? Taylor? Are you still with me? Ready? Is that you? Maybe it wasn't you that said it. You that did it. Maybe it was someone else. Their thoughts bleeding through into your brain. The fuck? Taylor, are you still with me? Every player merges into Taylor. We are not 25954 because as the game tells us, if we take the first letter of every protocol in the mission reports, we are Taylor. The twist of Black Ops 3 is not that you played through Taylor's memories. The game's twist is that you have just played through someone's interpretation of his memories, and analyzing and understanding that interpretation reveals the game's true main character. It's me, Taylor. I think it's time you woke up.
Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'd now like to give a very big thank you to everyone who became a patron during the production of this video. If you'd like to support the content, you can go to patreon.com dx and become a patron where you'll be featured in the next video's credits. A very big thank you goes out to Achintia Dutta, Actual Bastard, Ariel Voss, Ann Peck, Brigadier Hunter, Cameron Fairs, Connor Hicks, Daniel A. Hudson, Darren Kimball, DDX, Decepticon, Dude Nugget 2000, Aldex, Eternash, Ethos, Fourth Mathematics, Jared NDN 711, Johan Schaefer, John the Erudite Diaper, Kenny Nunez, Kieran Corrigan, Lolwell and Teapot, Luki Mana, Oxice, Prohe, Rennie Paid, Review Sword Art Online Season 3, Samnus Arendine, Silent Book, Sir Leon, Stort Elliot, Vera, and Windows 07. Thank you for supporting the content, and thank you for supporting the vision.